You're listening to Navigating the French on Paris Underground Radio. Hello, and welcome to Navigating the French, the podcast where each episode we look at a French word and try and see what it tells us about French culture. I'm your host, Emily Monaco. Today, I'm chatting with food historian Jim Chevalier. He's here to explain why Marie Antoinette could not have brought the croissant to Paris and why her country of origin is still given credit for it through the word for this category of beloved breakfast pastries. Viennoiserie. Okay, welcome, Jim. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Jim, can you tell our uh, listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do and why you're so interested in the word of the day, which is viennoiserie? Well, uh, my interest actually in that goes quite some time back. But uh, first of all, I'm a food historian. I began as a bread historian. In fact, it was my interest in the croissant that led me into that. Uh, very originally, I found myself writing an academic paper on the shift in breakfast in 18th century France and discovered I, I was all set to cover Marie Antoinette bringing the croissant to Paris and then discovered she could not have brought the croissant to Paris for various uh, factual reasons. And I dug deeper and ended up uh, writing this little book. It's now quite a while. It's been out called August Zang and the French Croissant. And that was the start of my being a bread historian. Within a year, I had written several articles for a French dictionary on bread. And then I put out a book on the baguette. I've continued with bread history. Uh, last year, I put out a book on the whole history of French bread from the Gauls on. And that sells nicely. And then, uh, meanwhile, I developed an interest in early medieval food. And I just put out a book on the food of the Franks, feasting with the Franks, the first French medieval food. So my early interest in bread history has led me in many places, but I've never stopped being interested in bread. Wow. Bread historian sounds kind of like a dream job. <laughs> It has been fun. As I, no, that sounds amazing. As I say, it's led me to many paths, too, so that's nice. That is very nice. And I discovered your work through that, what you call a little book. It was a big, important book for me because I, too, believed that Marie Antoinette had brought the croissant to Paris. I think it's a really pervasive rumor. And that sort of is a rumor or a legend that still remains linked, or a lot of people still think remains linked, to this word, viennoiserie, which is a category of baked goods whose name links them to the city of Vienna, which is the Austrian capital where Marie Antoinette was from. But before we go too deep into that legend, let's start with a really basic question, which is what is the major difference between a viennoiserie and a pastry? Well, a viennoiserie kind of straddles the territory between bread and a pastry. So it's a finer form of bread, uh, sometimes filled with chocolate or apples or something of the sort. Uh, when it's a croissant, it's just made with, uh, well, puff pastry, but people will quibble and say, well, really, it's uh, croissant pastry, which is puff pastry augmented with yeast. So the idea of laminated dough of puff pastry goes back to at least the 14th century in France. I think it's probably an Arab idea. And all by itself, there's a certain way of layering pastry with butter, layering dough with butter that will produce these little leaves, uh, which is that nice flaky quality we like in the croissant. And then if you add yeast, uh, it's augmented and they, they separate out all the much more. That is what in practice has come to define viennoiserie, which is kind of funny because in fact, Vienna goods were not defined that way at all. It's actually a French technique that was applied to Vienna-based goods and then came to define the whole category, which by the way, can even include brownies in France. So it's a fairly wide category. But uh, it's always been closer to bread than a real pastry, I have to say. Okay. So, yeah, like you have that that laminated croissant dough, which is going to be croissants, but also pain au chocolat, which is what we call a chocolate croissant in French, or like a pain au raisin, which is like a swirl with raisins in it. And then you also have these um, things in the in the bakery window called pain viennois, which is kind of like an enriched dough, like almost like a brioche, right? 
Yeah, Pam Venois has a very particular history because the Pam Venois you see in bakeries today, which really looks like a kind of glazed croissant and with a slightly different slashing pattern, uh, isn't much like the Pam Venois which first appeared with August Zang and which was one of the great luxury loaves of the 19th century. But the idea has evolved over the decades, as breads will. Right, of course. And so today in a lot of bakeries, you see, well, first of all, the one, one thing that I've noticed about the difference between viennoiserie and, and pastries is that both of them tend to be available in boulangerie, which is a place that sells bread. But if you're in a pastry shop, a pâtisserie, you usually won't find viennoiserie. They kind of seem to be the, the, the morning pastries that you find in a bread bakery, but you wouldn't find them in like a very highbrow pastry shop. I think they would consider themselves very above a viennoiserie because it really is, you know, it's a, a breakfast roll might be the simplest way to categorize a viennoiserie. I mean, they're not only eaten for breakfast, but really it's very much the kind of bread you have with your morning coffee if you have a true continental breakfast, whereas patisserie can really be very ornate and rich. It's much sugarier, for one thing. It often has some kind of filling or frosting on it. And um, again, the viennoiserie really developed out of a rich bread. It didn't, the whole history of pastry is very complex also in France because originally it only referred to things in dough, which was paste, which is paste. And in fact, the English used to say paste for dough. And anything made of paste was pastisserie, and that became pastry. But originally it was things like uh, pies, which could be meat pies and vegetable pies. So the whole evolution of pastry into a rich, sugary confection is its whole separate history uh, on top of that. But yeah, I don't think, well, in bread bakeries, sometimes you do see actual pastries, not necessarily because they really are two separate uh, items, but certainly in a true pastry shop, you won't see bread and you won't see a croissant even. Now, we've been dancing around this uh, this element of the Viennoiserie's history that I know you have done so much research and thought in, um, and so I want to delve right in. So we link these pastries, which are fairly classically French, as you mentioned, this technique of lamination that comes into France probably from the Middle East uh, or the Arab world and then ends up becoming pretty French in the way that it's done. We call all of these pastries viennoiserie. We've attributed their arrival with Marie Antoinette, but erroneously. Tell us, how did the viennoiserie, how did the croissant actually make it to Paris? Okay, so we begin long, long ago with an Austrian pastry called the Kipfel. And uh, that's documented going back to at least the 13th century. We don't know what shape the original Kipfel had. We know they existed. We know that by the 17th century, some, not necessarily all, but some were made in a crescent shape. We do know that there's another myth, which was invented during a siege of Vienna by the Turks. That myth is only mentioned in baking histories. You won't read it in any actual history of Vienna and of that siege. And there's just ample reason to believe it's simply not true. Plus, there's very good evidence that the Kipfel was made sometimes again in a crescent shape before that siege. So that's the original pastry, which but or bread, which sometimes, by the way, could look like a rugula. Sometimes it was, you know, nuts and honey, and it went from a savory to a sweet form. Then in uh, the late 1830s, you had this former art- artillery officer named August Zhang, who went to Paris now, some claim, but I've never seen a really detailed documentation for this, that he had been there as a tourist and just didn't like French bread. He just didn't think it was very good. And it should be said that most French bread, not all of it, but most was still done with sourdough, whereas the Austrians, being a beer drinking culture, had used yeast because yeast originally came from making beer. And so he decided they needed Viennese baked goods. So he opened this bakery on the Rue de Richelieu, which today is a pretty pedestrian street, but back then was probably one of the fanciest streets in Paris. So he didn't choose it by accident. He had some trouble getting it going. The French weren't all that interested in baked goods. And then he connected with uh, a very famous newspaper, which happened to be in the same building, got 
what was undoubtedly a paid mention, but was kind of a blind article that drew attention. And in late 1839, the bakery began to be very popular. All its goods were popular. And among other items, the French bakers began to imitate this little crescent shape. Kipful. And since it was shaped like a crescent, they just called it a crescent, which in French is croissant. Now, it happens that by far the most popular item for a long time was what the French came to call the Viennese loaf, uh, the pain viennois, which was very likely based on another Austrian loaf, which was what we call the, the Kaiser roll, except that the Kaiser semmel was originally a very fine piece of baked goods. And he used the dough for the Kaiser semmel, which had a little milk instead of water in it and used yeast instead of the sourdough the French were used to. And he apparently made it mechanically. He actually put it in a kind of mold, so it came out rectangular. The French bakers didn't. So the original Viennese loaves had all kinds of different shapes. There were different images of them. There's no uniformity to the shape. And that's important because what would happen later on is when sometime in the 20th century, people began to make it to look like the baguette, somebody got the idea that the original pain viennois looked like a baguette. And it was a short leap from that to claim that August Zhang had introduced the baguette to France, which is not vaguely true, but it's a very tenacious rumor. Meanwhile, the pain viennois was the luxury bread. If you were eating well, if you were living well, you ate pain viennois. The croissant crept in with it and uh, was already mentioned as a French bread by 1850, so not too long after Zhang had come, but it didn't have the prestige at first of the pain viennois. And then uh, towards the end of the 19th century, and the earliest mention I've seen so far was about 10 years before the end of the century, you begin to see laminated versions of what had been made with the Viennese dough of uh, milk and yeast. And suddenly the French began to use this French laminated technique with it. And bit by bit, that became the croissant. The whole category of Viennese breads, uh, which was generally any bread made with yeast, a little milk, and then glazed, and this was a very important innovation from Zhang. He introduced the Viennese technique of putting steam in the oven that will create a glaze on your bread. And the French bakers to this day use that technique, but it was especially used for Viennese bread. So you would look at bakeries and often they would say pain français, pain viennois. And the pain français was made with uh, sourdough and the pain viennois was made with yeast. And at some point, there were very rare mentions of this whole category of bread as viennoiserie. Now, viennoiserie was a general term that referred to fine, light things from Vienna. So a Strauss waltz was a viennoiserie. But uh, there was a mention towards the end of the century of the category of baked goods as being viennoiserie. So originally the term just applied to all these various Vienna style baked goods. And they really were originally Vienna style. But then as the laminated form of the croissant crept in, more and more people applied the term to the croissant. And as the croissant became a laminated dough based good, it really took a long time. I mean, I really don't know any exact date, but probably well past the 30s, where just the whole concept of viennoiserie really suggested more something made with laminated dough than it did anything made uh, in a Viennese style, because the pain au chocolat was included, the chausson au pomme, which is a French apple turnover, was included. And these increasingly were made with laminated dough, but they weren't vaguely Viennese. They were very French. And so, you know, that was a slow progression. I'd be hard put to, to put an exact date on when the shift happened. But certainly after World War II, Viennoiserie came to refer to a very French category of breads. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, Romancing in Paris, which delves into love, lust, and so much more in the city of light. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. <laughs> 
And now, back to navigating the French. And another shift that we're noticing now, and I'm not sure if we are able to pinpoint this, um, is that, of course, lamination at the origin is done with butter. But now in France, we often see two kinds of croissant for sale, one which is curved, and it's called the ordinary croissant, and the other one which is straight rather than curved, um, and it's called a butter croissant. And so the ordinary croissant is laminated with margarine, and the butter croissant is laminated with butter. So we have margarine-based croissants being sold in a lot of Paris bakeries. Do you know kind of when that came to pass? The difference between a croissant au beurre and a croissant au denaire certainly goes back to when I was a student in Paris uh, in the early 70s. So it's been around for a while. I believe it's the curved one, which is a croissant au beurre, and then the, the uh, croissant au denaire, I think, is the margarine-based I you know, I haven't been in France for a while. So it's the opposite. Um, it's the opposite. In that, and there's actually a push from bakers right now uh, who refuse to make the ordinary one, who are like uh, pushing to to divorce the curved shape from the this idea that it's ordinary because they want to claim that shape back. And so that's what I found so interesting, that if you buy a croissant in Paris that's shaped like a crescent, it's often not actually made with butter. I haven't followed that that development. I, I know in England they started to sell straight croissant at one point. Okay. Uh, but yeah, to the to the best of my knowledge, the uh, the curved one was the one made with butter. But certainly the classic one is made with butter, and margarine was basically a cost cutting move. Really, it was an economic move. And another cost cutting move that we're seeing right now as well is um, this this rush of well, rush. I don't know if rush is the right word, but there's um, somewhere between 60 and 80% of the croissants that are sold in Paris bakeries are actually delivered frozen and then baked on the premises rather than being made on site, which is another kind of interesting industrialization, I guess, of this industry that has seemed so um, so resolutely French and so, uh, I don't know, hand, handmade and authentic for such a long time. It's been a tendency for a while to, for people to use ready-made dough to make their croissant. Now, I had thought that there had been a move for quite a while to insist that you had to start from scratch if you wanted to sell a croissant as a croissant maison. And it, that might be the case. I don't know that everybody, when they're buying a croissant, checks to see if, if it's actually fit maison. But certainly the problem of pre-made dough is one that's been around for a while. And in terms of ordinary bread, uh, if you want to sell bread as being fit maison, you have to actually start from scratch. It's been true for a long time that people have been using ready-made dough to make croissant, but uh, I had understood there, w there was already quite a move against it for quite a while. I think you're absolutely right. And I think that is that indication that it has, you have to look for the word maison, which means house made to show that your croissant is made in house. And even if it's, you know, if it's hot and it looks fresh, if it doesn't have that word maison, it could have been made with a ready-made dough. But if that's been happening for such a long time, obviously, um, it comes down to the fact that laminating is a long process. Can you tell us a little bit? I know that you're not a baker, but as the historian, I'm sure you can tell me a little bit about how that lamination process is done, sort of how long does it take and how arduous is it? I can tell you because I've also tried to make my own croissant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, making croissant is one of those things that, you know, it's like playing a scale. Uh, in one sense, it's not that hard, but to play it crisply and in rhythm takes some practice with a metronome. And making croissant is largely a matter of rolling out a sheet of dough, rolling a sheet of butter across it, rolling another sheet of dough, rolling another sheet of butter across it. A woman who'd been an actual pastry chef once pointed out to me that you do well to chill it in your refrigerator between uh, laminations. It really is a question of touch and experience because you can follow the directions and the directions are fairly straightforward in themselves, but there's a definite uh, practice involved in getting it to work out just right. But you, really what it comes down to is uh, the original, like when I said that there was first a laminated croissant about uh, 1890. That was like two layers, I think. You rolled out one layer, you put some butter over it, you rolled out another layer. Now I, I don't even know how many layers you do, but it takes quite a few. 
And of course, once you've done that, then at some point you can slice it into the correct form and roll it up into a croissant. I believe you slice it into a triangle and then roll up the triangle uh, and then, you know, tweak the, the corners, tweak the edges so that it gets a little crescent shape. But the real nuance is to exactly how you roll it out and laminate it, how you let it rest between laminations. And uh, as I say, it apparently takes practice. I say apparently because I never got it that right. I made, made edible croissant, but that's about <laughs> the best you can say for them. And having talked to people who do this more seriously, it really is something that, ta- that takes some practice. And you mentioned earlier in our conversation that today the category of viennoiserie can include things like brownies. And obviously, um, I've I've seen that in Paris. I've seen also babka, which um, you know comes from Poland. I've seen bostock, which is English, and it's like a bread pudding. So this category of viennoiserie seems to be very elastic to kind of embrace things from all over the world, really. Does that strike you as something that is, um, I mean, I think a lot of people say, oh, well, that's so American, it's so globalized, but it seems like the French have often been willing to welcome breads and pastries from elsewhere. Is that the impression that you get looking at this through the lens of history? Oh, yeah. I I wouldn't say just welcome. I would say appropriate. (laughs) I mean, they they think of the croissant as French. (laughs) Appropriate, yeah. (laughs) um, I, I, I don't think Many French people would react well to being told the croissant is Austrian. And again, the very idea for laminated dough may come from Arab cooking. So, uh, yeah, I mean, think of coffee. You know, coffee was supposedly introduced by a Turkish ambassador. Now, that might be a myth in itself, but certainly uh, it was a foreign Arab innovation, and it's fundamental to French life today. So that's not unusual in French history at all. Uh, and the French were making pasta by the 18th century. You know, they loved pasta and they called it vermicelle, little worms. But uh, pasta has been a, a, I mean, they acknowledge pasta, I must say, as Italian, but they were making their own very early on. So yeah, the French are not shy about integrating other cultures' foods into their history. When I was doing, I didn't mention one of my books, which is a history of the food of Paris with uh, Roman and Littlefield. and one of the things I did for that book is I researched the history of steak tartare, uh, which is a dish that makes some Americans flinch because it's raw steak. From what I can tell, it was the Americans who came up with steak tartare. The earliest recipes I see for steak tartare are probably from Delmonico's or uh, some 19th century American source. And yet the the French have made it their own. So, yeah, that's, that's very typical uh, of the French. Awesome. And I don't know when you were last in Paris, but do you have a favorite croissant in the city? You know, I do. And uh, I'm not sure everybody would agree with me. But whenever I go to Paris, I go to Dumago and I have their more expensive breakfast, which is they have the filtered coffee. They they don't give you express. Well, they, have, they probably have espresso, but you can buy this coffee in a little pot. And they bring out a full breakfast with jam and butter and these lovely croissants. I just love their croissant. Now, one of the reasons I do that is because it is so easy to get a bad croissant if you just stop anywhere in some of the cafes near the Boulevard Saint-Michel, which, of course, is a big tourist area, I've had croissant that was just a crescent-shaped roll. It wasn't a real croissant at all. Uh, but they can call it a croissant because it's shaped like a croissant. It's shaped like a crescent. But, yeah, that's that's easily my favorite. Now, I don't think it's ever won any prizes every year. I think they have a particular prize for the best croissant. And I imagine that changes year to year. But when I go back to Paris, I always go over the de Magot and have one of theirs. Love it. Um, Jim, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. I just have one last question before we leave each other, and that is, what is your favorite word in French? My favorite word? Oh, I don't know that I have one, since it's almost a second language for me at this point. Um, Ratatouille comes to mind, because my mother wrote a poem about it, which emphasized its musicality. But... uh, And I have to say, you know, I arrived as a young American with uneven French at the French house I was staying at, friends of my family's, and uh, they were having a dinner party. And as somebody went downstairs, the hostess said, could you take down the poubelle? And I heard bell. Of course, that's beautiful. And uh, I 
she looked at me and said, do you know what Kubel is? And I said, uh, no. And of course, it means garbage. So the idea that a word for garbage could be so pretty is kind of entertaining. But, you know, I studied Baudelaire and Rambo and all that. So um, the whole French language to me is really beautiful. Amazing. I love it. Thank you so much for joining me, Jim. I really appreciate it. Um, and I hope you have a beautiful and not a trashy rest of your day. And thank you very much for having me. Emily. Bye-bye. This has been Navigating the French. You can find more from me, Emily Monaco, at Emily underscore in underscore France on Twitter and Instagram. This podcast is produced by Paris Underground Radio. To listen to other episodes of this podcast or to discover more podcasts like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com. Thanks for listening and à bientôt. This episode of Navigating the French was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.